All right, welcome back. It is now time to look at one of the most important concepts in all of calculus, the derivative. And it all starts with the tangent line problem that maybe you've heard about before. And so what a derivative is, is a representation of the slope of a function at a particular point. And this slope would belong to the tangent line at the line of that point. And so what a tangent line is, is if I had a function and it looked like this, let's just say, a tangent line would be a line that hits a point on this function, but barely touches that point and takes its slope, and that is the whole line, right? It doesn't have any curves. It's just a line that goes on forever that has the slope of a particular point on a function. And so we can use that information of the slope of that tangent line at a point to better explain the behavior at a function at certain points that we may be interested in. And so what we are in search of is a way to find that slope of that tangent line for any function at any point. And that can sometimes prove to be a difficult task. And so that is the simplest way to kind of think about the tangent line problem. How do we find the slope at a point on a function, which would also be the slope of a tangent line. And so in order to do that, we are going to use limits. And limits is all we have talked about so far up until this point. And so I am a little bit excited to get into derivatives now, but we also still have to work with limits a little bit yet here. So let's look at this graph right here. What is going on? Well, we have a function, f of x, this red line right here is our function. And then we have this green line here that is not a tangent line, because as you see, it's intersecting with our function at two different points. A tangent line only intersects at one point and it's gonna have the slope of that point. But this line intersects at two points. This green line is actually a secant line. And a secant line is a line that has the slope between two points. And you'll see that the slope between this point and this point is this line, which would be four units over six units if we were to count those squares. And so that is our secant line that I have drawn right here. Now, what are these points we're looking at? What are these two points and why are they even significant? Well, I don't have them labeled with specific numbers. Rather, I've replaced them with letters that can represent any number to kind of give a generalized form of what's going on here. So this point right here, we are going to say is at the x value c. And so when we plug c into our function f of x, we get this y value. So this would be f of c, right? When you plug in our value c into our function, we get this value. And so then what is this point? Well, this point is that c value plus some change in x that we represent with this delta x. And delta x is just a Greek letter that kind of looks like a triangle. But all this means is that we're adding some amount to c. It's some change in x. And so that would be this x value right here, which is that c plus that change in x. And so then the y value for this would be this whole value of x, this c plus delta x, plugged into our function, which is right here, right? If we plug in c plus delta x into our function, we'll get some y value. And so then the secant line here is giving us the slope between some point c on this function and another point c that has some change in that value of x. And so because of that, we also have a change in y, right? We moved somewhere along the x-axis to get this value in this point. And because of that, we also moved some way along the y-axis. We have a change in y. And this change in y, you could say, is equal to this value of y minus this value. If you want to figure out what's in between two points in the y-axis, you subtract them. So like if this was five right here and this was three, well, how much is in between there? Well, five minus three is two. So in this case, we could say that delta y is equal to f of c plus delta x minus f of c, which are our two values of y here. So then why do we have a secant line? Why do we even care about this at all? Well, the secant line, like I said, gives us the slope between two points on a function. And if you remember from algebra, our slope equation looks like this. We have m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we could also say that this is equal to the change in y over the change in x, right? We're looking at a difference of y values and a difference of x values. So we're looking at the difference or the change in those values. So then if we wanted to find the slope 
of the secant line, right? Remember, the secant line is the slope between two points on a function, particularly this point and this point in this example. If we want to find that slope, and I'm going to write m of the secant line, this would be equal to that change in y over change in x, which we have here and here. So this is going to be equal to delta x on the bottom, because that's our change in x, and then our change in y is equal to this right here. So we're going to have f of c plus delta x minus f of c. So that's really cool. Now we have represented the slope of our secant line in this scenario. We have the change in y values over our change in the x value, right? We went from c to c plus delta x. So the difference between those two things is that delta x. But why do we even care about that? Why do we care about the slope of the secant line? Well, think about it. As this delta x gets smaller, as our difference between c and c plus delta x gets smaller, so would our change in the y. And so what that means is, as our delta x gets smaller and smaller, this point is going to get closer and closer and closer to this point right here. And so what that means is, the slope of our secant line between these two points is going to slowly become just the slope at this point. As delta x gets smaller, or we could say approaches zero, as delta x gets closer to being nothing, zero, our secant line is going to get closer to just being the tangent line at c. And that's what we want. We want to know the slope at a point on a function. We don't want to know the slope between two points. We want to know the slope at just one point on a function. And so what can we do to look at a value as it approaches zero? Do we know about anything that we can use that allows us to do that? Well, maybe you've already guessed it from the title, but we're going to use a good old limit to do this. So if we look at the limit of the slope of our secant line, we are going to be able to get closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line at a point. So let's write that. Our slope of our tangent line is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero. Remember, we are interested in knowing as this difference between these two points becomes zero, what is going to be the slope of our line? And then we're going to have the slope of our secant line right here, which we know to be delta x on the bottom, and then f of c plus delta x minus f of c. And this just came from right here. This is the slope of our secant line over here. But now we're looking for the tangent line at our point c right here. So as this change in x approaches zero, we are going to get to the slope of that tangent line. And so this right here is our limit definition of a derivative, which is the slope of a tangent line at a point x on a function. And so this right here is a huge find. This is a really nice result that we can use to find the derivative of functions. And a quick little note on notation, we could say that this limit right here is equal to the derivative, which is represented by d over dx, of our function x, and we're gonna put that in brackets. And so that's our notation for a derivative of a function, but what it really means is this definition right here, this limit definition that we just derived. So now let's look at an example problem that uses this limit definition of a derivative. So now let's use our limit definition of a derivative to find the derivative of the function 3x plus five. And so what we're going to be finding is a function that represents the slope at any point on this function. So let's start by writing our definition here. We have that the derivative of our function f of x is equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of the following function, f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. Now you'll notice in this case that we don't have a value c in our definition here, and that's because that was used for the general case, but here we're actually looking at a real function that we have defined, the 3x plus five. So in this case, we are interested in a variable x rather than a certain value of x. So that's why you see x plus delta x rather than c plus delta x. So now how do we actually use this? Well, let's plug in each of these parts that we're plugging into our function into our function. And so this is going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero. And now let's plug in our value here that we're plugging into our function. So we'll plug x plus delta x into this function here. So we'll have three times x plus delta x plus five. 
Now, we're going to subtract just the actual function, right? So we're going to subtract, and always remember your parentheses here, 3x plus 5. If you don't put these parentheses here, you're going to make a mistake because this negative also applies to this 5, not just this 3x. Then we just write our delta x on the bottom. There's nothing to plug in. We just have delta x. So now let's simplify this and see what we can do with this function. We're going to have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 3 times x plus 3 times delta x, right? We just have this 3 that we're distributing into this quantity, plus 5 minus 3x minus 5, right? We distributed this negative into both parts of this quantity. And that's still all going to be over delta x. And then what I notice is that we have some terms that'll cancel out. We have this 3x and this negative 3x and this 5 and negative 5. So now all we're going to be left with is the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 3 delta x over delta x. And now we have a common factor of delta x that we can cancel out. And so this is just going to be equal to the limit as delta x approaches 0 of a constant 3. And we know that the limit as x approaches anything of a constant is just equal to the constant. So in this case, our derivative is equal to 3. So the slope at any point on this function here is going to be 3. So at the point x equals 1, the slope of the function is 3. At x equals 2, the slope of the function is 3. And this makes sense because this is just a linear function that doesn't have any curves to it. So no matter where you are on the function, you're going to have the same slope. So that's how we use this limit definition of a derivative. And one more thing I want to point out is that the reason we did all this manipulation here is that just like with our limits before, if we plugged in zero as this function stands, we would have a zero in the denominator, which doesn't allow us to evaluate the function. So every time we do this limit definition of a derivative, we're going to have to manipulate the function here because we already start out with a zero in the denominator because delta x is approaching zero and delta x is in our denominator of the function. All right, we're going to do another example here, and I think this is important to show you a few more things about the limit definition of a derivative, as well as derivatives in general. And the first thing is some more notation. We can also denote a derivative by writing f prime of x, which means the derivative of that function x. So there's going to be different ways to denote a derivative. But in this case, we want to know the derivative of the function x squared plus 1. And then we want to find the value of that derivative at x equals 2. So I'm going to write that we have f prime of x is equal, and now we got to write our limit definition of a derivative. So we'll have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of delta x on the bottom, and then f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And now let's use our function and plug in x plus delta x, and we'll have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of x plus delta x squared plus 1 minus x squared plus 1, and don't forget your parentheses, all over delta x. Now we can simplify and we'll write the limit as delta x approaches 0 is going to be equal to this quantity squared. So we're going to have to square that. So we're going to have x squared plus 2x delta x. Remember, if you don't know where that comes from, we're multiplying this term by this term and then multiplying it by 2 because that's how you square a quantity. And then we're going to have plus delta x squared. And I like to put parentheses around that. You don't have to, but I do that so that I know that it's a delta x and not x. And then we have that plus 1, and then we distribute our negative, and we have x squared minus 1. And again, that comes from distributing this negative into each term of that quantity. And then this is all divided by delta x. And now I can look at this and see that a few things are going to cancel. And that includes this positive 1 and negative 1. And this negative x squared and positive x squared, they're going to be 0. And that leaves us with just this 2x delta x and this delta x squared and delta x on the bottom. So we'll rewrite this and we will have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 2x delta x plus delta x squared all over delta x. And now each one of these terms has a delta x in it. So we can eliminate that factor and simplify even more. So we'll get rid of this one, this one, and one of these. So now we'll have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 2x plus delta x over 1, which we can actually get rid of that if we wanted to. It's just 2x plus delta x. And now we can plug in 0. 
So I'm going to write that this is equal to 2x plus 0, which equals 2x. That is our derivative. Now, do not make the mistake of plugging this 0 into x. It's delta x that is approaching 0, not x. So we only plug it into delta x's in our function, not x. So then this is our derivative. So then what does this mean? Well, this means that the slope at any point on this function is represented by this function. So if we want to know the slope at any x value, we just plug that x value into here, and that's going to give us the slope for this function. And we are actually asked about that in our question here. We want to know the slope at x equals 2, or specifically the value of the derivative at x equals 2. So we're going to actually do that here real quick. And I'll write it down here. We'll have that f prime of 2 is equal to 2 times 2, which equals 4. And where did that come from? Well, our derivative function is right here. Remember, f prime of x. We went through all of this, and now it equals 2x. And then we plugged in 2 into that x right here. So we have 2 times 2 equals 4. So that is the value of this, our slope at x equals 2 for this function. Now finally, a quick note, I do want to let you in on a little secret that not all points are differentiable. Not all points have a slope that we can define. And so here we have a function, f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 1, and we have a very sharp point at x equals 1 where these two lines are meeting. Now these two lines are part of the same function, but at x equals 1, there isn't an actual slope here because it is such a sharp point. From this side we have that the slope is 1 and this side is negative 1, but the actual slope at 1, it just isn't there. It's not a differentiable point. And this happens anywhere where you have a very sharp point on a function. It's not very common. Most functions are differentiable everywhere, but there's always a few, like your absolute value function, where you're going to have a problem. Another example of this is the function of x to the one-third power, or the cubed root of x, which is right here, at x equals zero. And this one's a little bit different because this isn't a sharp point, but rather at this point, the slope of the tangent line would be undefined because it would be a vertical line, which we know doesn't have a slope, right? A vertical line, the slope is some value over zero, which is undefined. So in a case like this, where your tangent line is a vertical line, you also have a point that is not differentiable on a function. So all the rest of these points on this function, you could find a slope using the derivative, and you can do that for these parts of this function. But at x equals 1 on this function, and x equals 0 on this function, you do not have differentiable points. And this is a little bit different than looking at continuity. Remember that both of these functions are continuous because they don't have any holes, gaps, or interruptions of, of any kind within them, right? This just keeps on going, and this keeps on going as well. There's no holes, there's no gaps at x equals 0 or x equals 1 in these graphs. But if these did have gaps, think about it. If there was a gap somewhere in here or in here, it wouldn't be continuous there. And we also wouldn't be able to take the derivative at that point, because if you have a gap, you don't have a slope, right? Because if you had a function that Let's say it stopped here and then it picked up over here. Well, there's no slope in between there. There's no slope in between those points. And so what we find is that differentiability implies continuity, but continuity does not imply differentiability. And what I mean by that is if your function is continuous everywhere, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's differentiable everywhere. But if a function has a derivative everywhere, then it has to be continuous because there wouldn't be any holes or breaks or gaps of any kind in that function. So hopefully that makes sense. And so then that's all I had on our limit definition of a derivative or our introduction to the derivative and the tangent line problem. If you want to see some more examples of us actually finding derivatives, you can click on the example video I'll have linked in the description as well as at the end of this video. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. So until then, I will see you next time.